Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 10, and this is session 49. Uh, previously, we were discussing the difference that grace makes uh, and, and the difference between now and uh, under the law. And the point we're making is that among all those things that are different, prayer is different as well. Now, we saw last time some examples in Israel's time passport program where they were under the law, and when things were going badly for them, what was expected of them was, yeah, to confess their sins and to turn from their iniquity and, and return to God. And, 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 and that would stop the judgment and return them to a place of blessing from God. Now, just to refresh our thinking, let's just hurriedly look at those. So this will give you an idea. Leviticus 2640, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers which they trespass, which they trespass against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember, and I will remember the land. One more that's often cited, and that's the Second Chronicles 7, 13, and 14. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I can't tell you in the past how many sermons I have heard on 2 Chronicles 7.14. Every single one of those guys preaching that sermon did not understand that that applied to Israel because they were under the law. That's a performance system. Everybody here understands that, right? We're not under a performance system. That's why it's called grace. If it's grace, you don't earn it. If it's grace, it's a free gift. You don't, it's not that you deserve it or, or, that, or that somehow you're supposed to get it. And so that's the difference that I'm trying to point out here between the law and grace. And the point of us looking at this issue is so that we understand that in this immediate context, there is no need to confess our sins in order to be in right standing with God. Under the law, that wasn't the case. If they, if they rebelled against God and, and walked contrary unto Him, they were not in right standing because they were under a performance contract called the Law of Moses. And, and that means they had to repent and confess and do all that to get restored. You and I, as members of the body of Christ, living in this dispensation of Gentile grace, do not need to confess our sins in order to be in right standing with God. We, we are already forgiven. We are already in right standing. Our sins are already completely dealt with. There is nothing more to do with them. He didn't just forgive them, but He still holds them against us. That's not it. So, uh, there, there, there is no law that we are under now. And that means that there is no requirement for us to make confession and, and for us to do acts of contrition or repentance. Everybody understands that. Look, I realize there's somebody listening to this right now and they don't have all the background. They've just kind of come in on the study. And for them, that is a hard thing to understand. Because to them, when you grew up like I did with 1 John 1, 9, you know, and then, and then someone comes along and tells you you don't need to confess your sins, they're thinking, well, what am I supposed to do? And that's realized they have already been dealt with in Christ. That's a finished process. Now, what does God really want? He doesn't want you to get down on your knees with tears coming out of your eyes and going, oh, I'm so sorry. What does He want? He wants you to learn. Yeah, He wants you to get it right. That's what He wants. So, and, and you can't be in any better standing than you are right here today in Jesus Christ. No amount of confession can improve that. No acts of contrition can change that for the better. And so just to make sure that we understand that we are under grace, and that means all of those sins have been completely dealt with, 
Let me just run through them real quickly. This is the end of last week's study, so here it is. Oh, I had one more in Daniel. This is Israel. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. There's somebody today teaching that you need to keep the commandments in order to be saved, and this is the verse they're going to. What's wrong with that? Yeah, that's part of Israel's prophetic program. You're not in that today. If I had a nickel for every preacher that got that wrong, we'd all be going out to eat after the service. We're going anyway. Clifford's buying, so. <laughs> Keeping covenant and mercy to them that love him, to them that keep his commandments. We, this is what Daniel says. We have sinned and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy service. The prophets was spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. That's certainly the way it worked under the law. And just to give you one more to finish that up in Daniel 9-11, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. What's he talking about? The curse is poured upon us. Is that some random bad thing that happened to them? No, those were all outlined back in Leviticus 26. This is not a shock. They were told up front, if you don't obey, these things exactly are going to happen to you. So he says here, therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God. Aha! It's written! And I just told you where, Leviticus 26. Now, because we have sinned against him, and he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. What is the great evil? In a general sense, what is the great evil? It's the course of punishment, right? Of course. And for under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet, see, he tells them again. It's written back there. This is not God just looking down and going, you know what, I think I'm tired of that. I'm going to do this to you. All of this was prescribed ahead of time. All this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. See, when he was saying, if their enemies were overcoming them, the prayer is not, oh dear God, please give us victory over our enemies. If it's a drought, the prayer is not, oh dear God, we need rain. Because God is only waiting for Israel to hear one thing. What is it? Yeah, repentance, confession. That's what he's waiting to hear from them in order to restore them. Now, for us... Not so. Very different. We do not confess our sins in order to be in right standing with God. And by the way, that verse that we all grew up hearing, <laughs> remember over there in 1 John, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that 1 John 1, 8 and 9, that thing is something that I grew up with in the Baptist church. And we're always talking about, look, if you don't do that, you're not going to get your prayers answered. If you don't do that, that God's not going to bless you. If you don't do that, then all kinds of bad things happen. And you know what? That is only being said to you by someone who does not understand grace. And the difference between being under the law and not being under the law. And so I think everybody here has it nailed down, but I'm saying this for the recording because there's someone listening to this that they're just going to have a hard time with this. And I know, even though I've said it to you and you hear it, and I say that you are, let's just draw our little guy up here one more time real quickly. Okay, and wow. That's skewed. Sorry. Okay, so look, here's our... Here, 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 here's our guy. And then... Uh, Alright, so look. Here's our little guy up here. And he... He's happy because this is Christ. And he's in Christ. 
And when he's in Christ, he has a litany of things that, are, that he is the beneficiary of. And how did he get in Christ? Yeah, he just put his faith in what Jesus did in his redemptive death, burial, and resurrection. That's all he did. He put his faith in that. That is sufficient. And so, as a result, that, and you know what? I left off, that. I had it in my notes, but I guess I missed it on the PowerPoint. I had that 1 John 1, 9. I sure did. I just missed it. So, um, so anyway, I'm sorry. I just, that's kind of throwing me off. I'm, I'm missing a page. Where is that? Pa oh, no wonder. It's printed front and back. And I flipped it over like it was only on the front. No wonder I thought I was missing a page. Hello, Michael. Okay. So everybody gets it. If you're Israel, your right standing is dependent upon you confessing sin. And well, I can remember those preachers preaching that, and they'd say, here's the key. Boy, when you keep short accounts with God, when you, when you mess up, when you sin, they, um, confess it immediately and just keep short accounts because they thought that is what it took to be right with God. Look, how many of our sins did, did boy, that guy is bald just like me, isn't it? Let's give him some hair and an ear. How about that? Oh, look, okay, I feel better. I looked back and I thought it was like zombie man. Okay. So this guy, he gets in Christ by putting his faith in Jesus Christ as his all-sufficient Savior. And that means all of those sins are dealt with. I ask you the question, I'll just answer it. All of those sins are dealt with. There's not one that's not dealt with. You have to come to grips with the doctrine that your apostle is teaching you and not go back to the Old Testament like you're still under the law. That is so frustrating to me. Because that's where the majority of the preaching is. And I'm sorry, but Satan is loving that. Because if you don't understand what God is doing today, you're certainly not going to labor with him in it. And Satan loves that. So it's time to get out of the dark and come into the light and understand the truth of who we are in Christ and what has been done for us. So now, what, now we got off on this because remember... Last time, I gave you that wonderful outline of the book of Matthew. Do you remember that? Worked my fingers to the bone. And we got right down to where we were going to have to look at a verse that was a little bit confusing. So I want to come back to that verse. I'm going to straighten out that confusion. It is in what is typically called the Lord's Prayer. I don't really like that designation, but if you call it anything else, people don't know what you're talking about. But this is not the prayer that Jesus prayed. And this is not the prayer, I'm going to say it now, but I'm going to show it to you in a minute. This is not the prayer you're supposed to repeat like a magic mantra that does away with all the bad stuff. This is not his version of abracadabra. This is not that it's not that. That's what superstitious Gentiles do with scripture when they don't understand the truth of it, they just turn it into something it was absolutely not supposed to be. So, let's just look at this one last time. Here we go. Matthew uh huh. Did, did we do these? We didn't do these. I thought I ran us through that. I guess it was on the back side of the page. Well, remember, I said all of our sins are taken care of, so here it is. But to him that worketh not, did you get that? To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his works are counted for righteousness? No, his faith is counted for righteousness. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Here's the next one, Ephesians 1.7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Here's the next one. Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's a past tense thing. That's done. Look, when you understand this doctrine, it's like a load comes off your shoulders. Not because you're trying to sin and get away with it, but because you understand... He has completely dealt with that issue. 
Colossians 2.13, And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcised your flesh, hath ye quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So every one of those are taken care of. All right, now, that, now I said I'd left 1 John 1 out. Here it is now. There it is. I, I, it's because I didn't flip to the back page. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. But wait a minute. Who is 1 John written to? It's written to the believing remnant. Let me show you something genius about that. Let's do a timeline here. So in this timeline of events, here's the cross, and then you have that one-year extension of mercy. Sorry. Okay, it's over. That one-year extension of mercy. Then, what do you have at the end of that? Now, you have Saul of Tarsus getting saved on the Damascus Road. The Lord, he not only gets saved, but the Lord begins to reveal to him the mystery of Christ, calls him to be the apostle to the Gentiles, and then commissions him to go to the Jew first. And why is he going to the Jew first? To explain it. To tell them, God is no longer working your program with you. Those days have stopped. And then he's also going to go to the Gentiles. And what's the message for them? God is now working with you directly, not through the agency of Israel. Everybody understands this, right? Back in the, if we were to back this up, back in the Old Testament, are there scriptures back here where God talks about in the end there's going to be a kingdom, and, and in that kingdom Israel is going to be the head of all nations, and that he is going to do some wonderful things to Gentiles. He is. But that is all going to be through the agency of Israel. In other words, everything is going to come through them. That's why they're going to be a kingdom of priests. What is a priest? It's a go-between between man and God. And they're going to be a kingdom of priests. Who's going to carry the word of God? The Bible says it will go forth from what city? Jerusalem. That's in Israel. All of that was then. And so the, the, the Gentiles were going to be blessed, but it was going to be through the agency of Israel, and not until what? Not just any time, because were Gentiles being blessed back here? No, they weren't. They were without hope and without God in the world. I'm quoting there. Well, if, if they're not being blessed back here, why not? Okay, because it is only through Israel, well, there was an Israel, but what does Israel have to obtain before they can be that conduit of blessing? Because back here, weren't they rebellious? Wasn't Daniel talking about we've sinned and committed iniquity, we've, and, and we've walked contrary unto you? God's not using that kind of an Israel to be the source of blessing to the world. You know what he's going to use? He's going to, he's going to use a believing Israel. Not an Israel that worships Baal and all those other false gods. He's talking about an Israel now. That he, and they are going to have to be the fulfillers of the Abrahamic covenant. And he says to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation. And what is that issue? That is not greatest in number because Israel never has been the biggest population of any nation. Not biggest in land area. Look at a map. There are plenty of nations with more land area than the nation of Israel. The fact that he says, I will make of you a great nation, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. They are great, not because of their population. They are great, not because of their land area. They are great because... Because of what God is going to do with them. They are the means by which he will do something. What? Okay, okay. <laughs> they will be a, the means by which he will bless all the nations of the earth. Thank you. He, they are the means by which he will repossess the earth from the adversary. That's what this whole thing is about. Remember, he was the usurper. He was the prince of this world. And so God is saying, look, I'm going to repossess that, and I'm going to use them as my tool to do that on the earth. How's he going to repossess the heavenly places? 
Yeah, with us, the members of the body of Christ. There's the repossession of the heavens and the earth. But look, so they are going to be that great nation when they are fit to be utilized in God's plan and purpose for them. What is that plan and purpose? To repossess the earth back to God. To be the extension of His righteousness in the world. And so, when does that happen? If we're looking up at the timeline, here's, here's where it happens, right here. At the kingdom. I know it's not very prominent up there, but when he sets up his kingdom, who's going to be there? Every single Israelite? Think carefully. That's a trick. Only the believing remnant. Okay, I got another trick question for you. I've already warned you, it's a trick. So just think about it. Is every member of the believing remnant going to be in the kingdom when he sets it up? Did you say no, baby? And she's right. Because she's my wife and I am not going to tell her she is wrong. No. No, she is right. She is right. I need to explain that was my wife. Somebody's on the, on the recording going, who's he calling baby? What, what is that about? Okay. So, this... This, this is true, and we're going to talk about that today. Very excited for us to talk about that. Because that's the whole premise of the verse that everybody's having a struggle with. So, yes, out here, so now, here's what we have here. The dispensation of Gentile grace. You following me along here? All right, so you have the cross, the one-year extension of mercy. God interrupts the program with Israel. Now he begins calling out members of the body of Christ. And they're composed of who? Two groups. They're, the members of the body of Christ are made up of two. He hath made of twain one new man. Who's the twain? Jew and Gentile. So now it doesn't matter if you're an Israelite or not an Israelite. God is now working with us directly, and we don't thank God for this. We don't have to wait for stubborn, rebellious Israel to become the great nation. We don't have to wait for the resumption of the program and the establishment of the kingdom. God is now working with us Gentiles directly. It won't always be that way. When will that end? Oh, thank you. The blessed hope. So right here, the Lord descends from heaven. We rise to meet the Lord. Commonly referred to as the rapture. Titus calls it the blessed hope. And at that event... God is through with the dispensation of Gentile grace. And now he is going to resume his program with Israel and bring it to a conclusion. And the conclusion will be the great and terrible day of the Lord where he returns to put down his enemies, establish the kingdom. And it is at that point where he establishes that millennial kingdom. There's some things that happen after that. But when he establishes that kingdom... <clears throat> The members of the believing remnant, not only the ones who are alive after Daniel's 70th week, but also the righteous dead, the ones who believed, who, who lived in the past. So you know what we find? David is resurrected for the kingdom. Is he the only one? No. All of those that believe back there will be resurrected to the kingdom. And so... There's going to be a, and that kingdom now is going to be for the purpose of sending that message out to the Gentile nations and rep repossessing the earth back from the adversary. Okay, with that in mind, having said that, now let's look at this thing in Matthew. <clears throat> well, we're back to prayer, but everybody understands the context here, right? So we're back to prayer. Matthew 6, 9. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, do I have, do I have everything on that? 
I got one more. Ready? It's the rest of it. I thought it was short. For, now wait, the prayer is over, right? Amen. The prayer is over. But now he's going to go back and pick up a thread in that prayer. It is actually verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So let's see what he says, because he's going to go back. Because when they hear that, some of them are going, uh, wait, what? Because what does that imply? If you don't, that's right. Something is contingent here. So take a look. Here's the rest of it. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now what I want to do... Now, someone is preaching that verse today, and you know what they're saying? You, in order for you to be forgiven, you're going to have to forgive others. If you do, God's not going to forgive your trespasses, and you're going to the lake of fire. Someone says, well, what about if I'm already saved? They'll say, well, this is how you know you can lose your salvation. So you're not only going to have to trust Jesus now, you're going to have to do some things. Here's one of them. Forgive those that trespass against you. Now that is a dangerous doctrine. Do you know why? Because it's false. It's not true. They don't understand the context of where they found themselves in Matthew 6. Which is why... I so ever generously gave you that whole outline of the book of Matthew so you could see a flow of doctrine and a context for everything we're going to be looking at. Do you see how good I am to you? That was timely. Okay. So, let's focus on those last couple of verses. <clears throat> um, looking at this prayer, let me just show you a couple of things. Um, first of all, back up to it. That prayer is not being given to them to say, repeat this all the time. Notice how he introduces it. He says, after this manner. In other words, like this. This is not an exact formula. He's just saying, here's the kinds of things that ought to be in your prayer life. Now, if you know anything about this right here, what was Israel preaching back here during the days of the Messiah and on through the extension of mercy, what was the gospel being preached? Did somebody say it? The kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. And what was part of that message with regard to the kingdom? What about the kingdom? It was at hand. Repent for the kingdom is at hand. That is said over and over and over in the Gospels. And why is he saying the kingdom is at hand? Now, does anybody know anything about this dispensation of Gentile grace? The answer is no. That was a mystery until God revealed it to Paul. So you know what? You could take this and shove that right over to there. And what you'd have is... The kingdom, he didn't say the kingdom is here. What did he say? It's at hand. Which means it's not here yet, but it's close. And when you look at the entirety of Israel's program, you are at the very last part of the program. In fact, after the cross, how many more years of Israel's program have you got, uh, prophetically speaking? Eight well, considering the very first course of punishment up there, right here, that was 450 years. And that's just number one. How about this one? That's 400 years of silence. If you get down to the last eight years, you know what you're thinking? I might actually live to see this. It's at hand. So... <clears throat> The kingdom is being preached to be at hand. If that's the case, wouldn't when, when they said, hey, teach us how to pray, one of the first things Jesus says is, how about this? Thy kingdom come. 
If you know you're at the end of the program, and you do because Daniel gave you a timeline, and you know you're in the days of the Messiah, and you know the end is at hand, and the kingdom, therefore, is at hand, and, and, and that's what's being preached there, then when you pray, Dear Lord, thy kingdom come, what are you doing? This is important, because you're not only going to recognize this for Israel's program, you're about to learn something about prayer and the dispensation of grace. If the Lord has, if you already know the kingdom is at hand and you're praying, thy kingdom come, what are you doing? You're praying for the, the earth to be repossessed. Oh, okay, you're praying for the earth to be repossessed? And, 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 so for God's to be that's right, you're praying for God's will that as you know it, you know this part, you're praying for that to be done. Would you say that's a legitimate prayer? Yes. If you prayed that, if you were sitting back here and you prayed thy kingdom come, would you be praying in the will of God? And how do you know that? Because that is yeah, because it's being declared. It's being declared. When, 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 let's go back to Daniel when he was saying, look, what was written in the law of Moses is coming upon us. How does he know that? Because it was written in the law of Moses. He's able to see it. Well, that's the... See, and so what I'm trying to say is those things that are in that prayer, they are... Some of them are the express will of God that has been openly declared. So wouldn't it make sense to go, Lord, thy kingdom come? Wouldn't, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that make sense? But now, let's look at the verses that give us uh, pause, if not trouble. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Would it be safe to say that is God's will? Is it God's will for them to forgive those who trespass against them? I would think from the things that Jesus said here, it, you, could, you could certainly say that is God's will for them to do that because of what follows. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. No matter what you think that is, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? And he says, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive. So you think it's God's will for them to do that? By the way, where is this? This is in Matthew chapter 6. So we're sitting back here, right here, in the days of the Messiah, Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you are in the major doctrinal issue in the first section of the book of Matthew, which runs from chapter 1 to the end of chapter 7. And what is that major doctrinal issue? It is the Sermon on the Mount. And in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, may I remind you, he started correcting, at the start of chapter 6, he started correcting three ways that men tried to appear holy, but because it was part of Israel's vain religious system, God said, those things aren't holy at all. So I'm going to correct those things and I'm going to show you how to do them properly the way your father, your heavenly father intended. Anybody remember what those three things were off the top of your head? Prayer was one. That's the one. Good. That's the one we're in. Prayer. What else? Almsgiving. Fasting. Oh, y'all are good. Y'all did good. So he said, there's a way that this gets practiced by Israel's religious system, and it's wrong. Do you remember what the wrong thing was with regard to prayer? We'll look at it, but you might just recall right off the top of your head. Yeah, they were doing it out in the open for what reason? Yes, yeah, so everybody look at them and think they were so spiritual. And, here, and Jesus said, verily, you have your reward. Yeah, praise of men. That is not the purpose of prayer. This is important for us to learn this purpose of prayer because even though the doctrine is different, the purpose of prayer pretty much remains the same in every dispensation. So if we see it in Israel's program, the light will come on in Paul's epistles and you'll go, oh, that's what it's about there. Okay, where are we, Mark, at 45? 
Oh, 34. Yeah. Okay. So I'm only doing two sessions. See, I'm using psychology on you. So you'll think we're going to get out early. <laughs> okay. So let, let's, so let me give you, let me give you, having said that that prayer is not a script. And when I said to you a while ago, it's not a magic mantra that you repeat. You ever notice on the movies? In the movies, when the alien is breaking in the door and they're all huddled in the corner, someone's going, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And everybody starts going, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And the angels are going, Shut up! What, did you think that was a magic bullet? You thought that was a wooden stake? You thought that was a, a, a hanging of garlic? And suddenly now it magically repels the monsters? You know what he just told them before this prayer? Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. So when he gives them a prayer, you know what they think? Well, let's just repeat that. In fact, there's even a religion that when you mess up, they'll go, do however many our fathers. You know what? A guy that does, I'm just being honest. No, maybe I just shouldn't say that. I was thinking maybe he should get an honest job, like construction. Because that is a disservice and an injury to the truth. Someone is listening, and now for the last time. But I am sorry that you would be upset because that is the truth of the matter. Quit blindly following traditions of men and... Look at the word. Okay, so now having made everybody mad and dealt with that, and it's just us again. So here's what real, real prayer. I don't know if there's a front prayer and a rear prayer. Okay, so here's what real prayer is supposed to be. Real prayer is, now I'm going to enlarge on this, but I just want you to see this right now. The enjoyment of intimate fellowship with God. I am going to detail that for you. Right now, I'm just giving you a one, two, three. In other words, that is the means whereby we have fellowship with God. Number two, it is intelligent communion with God about some things. I'm going to talk about that word communion because it means something. We, when we think of communion, what do most people think of when you say communion? Yeah, they, yeah, they think you're taking the Lord's table. So, but that's, this is not what this is about. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment. We're going to define that term so that you actually see what that is talking about. But first, let's talk about this is an intelligent communion with God about, and here's the first one. First of all, what God is doing. And I don't mean what he did back in Israel's program for us. I mean what he's doing right now in the dispensation of Gentile grace. That is part of the subject of our prayer life. And there's a reason for that. By the way, if you did not know the kingdom was at hand, you would probably never think on your own to pray what? Thy kingdom come. Because at any other time back in Israel's program, I'll oh, just look at it on the big one here. In the four, because here, here we are in the days of the Messiah. Did did anybody preach the kingdom at hand during the four hundred years of silence? And why not? Because because God wasn't saying anything. That's the whole idea of silence. I know when we're, we're when we rear children, we don't think silence means anything, but to God, it actually does. How about back here? Does, did they preach the kingdom at hand back here? No. Do you know why? Because it wasn't at hand. Whole generations are going to die before it shows up. So, my point is to say, unless you knew what was happening, if you knew what God was doing, you could pray in accordance with His will. Yes? So that's what I'm talking about. Intelligent, and when I say intelligent, I don't mean high IQ. What do I mean by intelligent communion with God? About, yes, informed, educated. 
So when you prayed back here, thy kingdom come, it's because you knew that the, the message, the kingdom's at hand. The Messiah is telling you that. So that's an, edu that's an intelligent prayer. Here's the unintelligent prayer, and I give it to you by degrees. Uh, now, Lord, if you decide you want to go ahead and have your kingdom, then you go ahead and do that, but if you don't, that's okay too. What does that, what does that say? That maybe you're unsure of that message? Or maybe the message isn't right? Or maybe the messenger is mistaken, and you're not sure? So you just want to kind of cover all the bases. Is that real faith? No. Here's a worse one. <laughs> Someone is preaching the kingdom's at hand and you go, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Kingdom's not at hand. Things are happening now just like they've been happening along. The kingdom is not at hand. Did Israel ever do those kinds of things, by the way? That's just about all they ever did. <laughs> do, you, do you remember when Nebuchadnezzar came against the southern kingdom and the prophet was saying, you're going to get carried away captive and the land is going to lie desolate for 70 years and you guys, you know what, you're at the end now where God is going to spew you out of the land. There were guys that actually stood up. It's recorded back in the prophets where they said, okay, look, you know what? He may take some things out of the temple, but we're not going away into captivity. That is ridiculous. Why? Because we are God's chosen people. Is that a true statement for them back there? Of course. Why do I talk like I'm a soprano when I do that? Stop it. That's right. It was a true statement, but it did not override the statement that God told his chosen people that they would be spewed out of the land and taken away captive into their enemy's lands. No, see, and, they, and you know why that message gained traction? Do you know why that message gained traction? Because they were in unbelief. Because, okay, they were in unbelief. Give me one more part. That's true. I'm not denying that at all. That's a right answer. But there's one more component of that. It wasn't just that they didn't believe it. Okay, it's not just that they didn't... Okay, maybe I should ask this question. Why didn't they believe it? Yeah, there you go. They didn't want to believe that. Do you think there was anybody in that group that was thinking, I don't know, everything the prophet's been talking about has been happening, and he's saying we're going to go away captive. But now we got all these religious leaders that are opposed to that guy, and that guy's a troublemaker and a charlatan, and God's not with him. Don't worry about him. God is not going to let... You know what you'd have to do? You have to make a decision now about what you're going to believe, and the decision you make is probably going to come down to what do you want to believe? Do you think that's true today? I guarantee you, when you talk to folks about... The Gospels not being for us in the dispensation of Gentile grace, but being for Israel back there in their program in the days of the Messiah, they are going to reject that. Do you know why? They don't want to believe that. True, right? They don't want to believe it. People do that with prayer. They hear it about prayer and they go, I don't, I don't want that to be the way it is. I want God to be my genie in the bottle. I want to be able to just tell him, I, I need you to watch over us when we travel, and I need you to heal us when you're sick, and, and I need a better job, and I need more money, and I need people to like me, and, and, and we like that one. And because we like that one, that's the one we're going to believe. And you know what? I've had people, look, I, 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 I've, I've heard that on all kinds of subjects. Look, I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm, just, I, I'm still going to believe what I believe. Do you know Why? Because that's what you want to believe. Don't act like that's an innocent statement. You know what? If Israel said that to God, you know what we think? When we hear about the prophet saying you're going away captive, and these guys saying, no, we're not. And you know, what, what does God think of that? Does he go, well, you're entitled to your opinion. Willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. And that's exactly what he thinks today. 
I'm not saying he's mad at you and he's not going to take you away captive into your enemy's lands. No. But he's not pleased with that kind of attitude. Okay, enough about that. Rode my little hobby horse. I'm over it. Where are we now? Stop and take a break. Because when we come back, how far have we gotten on these notes? This is terrible. We got a whole page done? Okay, okay. Good deal. All right. So take a break and we'll come back.